It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. This is our pre-St. Patrick's Day episode, and Dan and Matt are back with you to talk about another week of Flames hockey. How you doing, Matt? Good. Looking forward to the week upcoming. And not only the week upcoming, but it's been a good week for the Flames this past week as well. The Flames had three games. They beat the Ducks on Wednesday, and that was quite a hand, uh, big win. That was a 6-3 win for the Flames. Were you expecting the Flames to get a win in that one? Not really, but the Flames seem to have the number against the Ducks in Calgary. Not quite to the same extent that they have ours in Anaheim. And then the Friday game was another 6-3 win, which I think we were all expecting that win. That was against the Maple Leafs, and uh, I was honestly surprised the Leafs were able to get three goals in that game. Well, Jonas Hiller wasn't exactly on his game, especially on that third goal. He kind of deflected that one into his own net, so it's Toronto. You know, they're not exactly a good hockey team. Like, right now, they're losing to Edmonton 4 nothing in the first period. So, it is what it is. Yeah, and, you know, I, I guess it's it's really nice as a Flames fan to see us get up like that. Um, to me, that was, that was a lot of fun, is to see the Flames get up that much and, you know, get a, a six goals and two games they had twelve goals and that was really nice to see. It's re- it puts a lot of confidence in you going down the stretch. Yeah, and unfortunately, they the next night they lost to Colorado three two, but it wasn't for a lack of trying in the third period as they just kept firing the puck at Varlamov and he just kept them at bay. Yeah, that that was a. That was quite a tough game. You're right. But Varlamov really stole the show on that one. Um, I think that the Flames, if it wasn't for Varlamov, I think the Flames would have had a lot more goals there. Oh, definitely. There was at least three shots that if, say, Red Obara or Calvin Pickard was in that, they would have scored. It's just when you got the defending Vesna trophy winner, against you and he's on his game you're not gonna have an easy night yeah the flames were out working the excuse me the flames were out working the avalanche for most of that game and yeah i feel like they deserved a better result but you know coming away after two strong games at home that's that's an okay as much as you don't want to lose any of the three games all week i guess that's the one that would have they they that's the one that i would prefer that they lost yeah, uh, you're not going to win every game. And like even against weaker opponents, there are games that you're going to lose. And it's frustrating, but at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world. They have a game tomorrow against St. Louis that they need to have a strong effort for. And then the next five games are all against weaker opponents. So hopefully the Flames can bounce back against the Blues and then push ahead against some weaker opponents. Well, it's been a while since we've won, or sorry, it's been a while since we've lost two or three consecutively in a row. Um, You know, generally this team is really good at bouncing back, and we've seen a lot of wins lately, so I have have no doubt that the Flames are going to come back. Yeah, and this is the key time in the season, the next handful of games, to hopefully cement themselves firmly in a playoff spot instead of being on the bubble with Winnipeg and L.A. And talking about this good week that the Flames have had, um, Yari Hoodler also had a fantastic week if we are going to single out a Flame. He has uh, he has quite, quite a, a set of records here. Um, all of them came against Toronto. He matched his career high in goals in that game, um, and he set new records for assists and points. And as of right now, he's sitting at 66 games played, 25 goals, 35 assists for a total of 60 points. And, you know, I I think we talked about this before, but yeah, Hoodler's really looking good this year. And I hope that we see the same Yari Hoodler next year, because this is the kind of player that we need in order for the Flames to be successful long term. What a perfect foil for the two youngsters, Gaudreau and Monaghan, to have to bounce off of, eh? Oh, for sure. And, you know, I I was saying this last season when we were talking about the rebuild. I said you can't have all young kids. 
you have to have some veteran guys. And I think this is a great example of why. You know, Yari Hoodler's kind of become the the anchor on that team, the veteran mentor of those guys. And I, I think that all three of their successes this year, we can we have to tribute to them as a line. Definitely. And the fact that all three of those players are now over 50 points is somewhat remarkable, especially heading into the season where there was so many question marks on where the goals and the points would come from. Yeah. Well, and, and also for Goudreau, I mean, a guy who at the beginning of the year we didn't think was going to make this team. You know, you and I both had him, I believe, going to Adirondack in our preseason preview. And for Goudreau to be over 50 points now, that really shows that he does belong in the NHL. Well, not only that, but he's tied for first with uh, Philippe Forsberg in Nashville for the rookie scoring lead. Yeah, he keeps making more and more of a case that he should be the Calder, uh, the Calder champion this year. Yeah, and especially the two other guys, uh, Ekblad and Forsberg. You look at them, and the, you know they're not five foot six. Yeah. So, it, I would give the more deference to Gaudreau just because of his stature. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'll definitely come into play. I think a lot of it's going to depend on how those teams do, if they do, in the postseason. True. Like, if the Flames actually do make the playoffs, I think that you'd pretty much already be penciling his name on the trophy list there. Yeah, we we talked about this early in the season when we talked about uh, Bob Hartley winning the Jack Adams trophy, but... I hope that it doesn't come down to just the teams in the playoffs winning these because I think the Flames have three great hardware candidates this year in Goudreau, um, Hartley, and Giordano. And I hope that if we don't make the postseason, that those players still get fair consideration. I agree wholeheartedly. Well, let's uh, let's chat about another surprising thing that happened this week. Um, to me, the Hoodler career highs were surprising but we also found out that uh, Douglas Murray a guy who's been known to be a pain in the Flames backside when he played for the Sharks is now in Calgary and on a part-time tryout agreement practicing with the Flames if Murray is to get signed this year just to make er, make sure everyone's aware he would be able to finish the regular season here but he would not be eligible for postseason play so, Matt, do you think they're seriously looking at signing this guy down the stretch, or do you think they're just bringing him in to have an extra body on the blue line at practice? Well, it wouldn't hurt. It, if you've looked at the play of Rafael Diaz lately, he hasn't been quite as sharp the last five or six games. It doesn't hurt. If Murray can come in and take a spot... To spell some of the other guys, I don't see that being a bad thing. I don't know as if he'd get many games. Like, if the Flames actually do end up clinching a playoff spot, I think he might get a game or two towards the end of the year just to give some of the other defenders a rest. But beyond that, I don't see a problem. And if he can come in and take a spot, why not? It, it also is a good addition for next year in case the Flames are looking at possibly signing him sort of as the Rafael Diaz type guy for next year. See, the issue that I have with uh, with Douglas Murray is he's more of a goon than a guy like Diaz is, and I think that we're seeing that goon role go away in the NHL. So I'm not sure if bringing him in is a good idea. I don't think that we've seen really a year where he's shown he can play another type of role. He's definitely an agitator, and that's what our team needs this year. But I just worry that he'd take too many undisciplined penalties when we're in a spot where the Flames need discipline right now. It's one of those things that it's not really that important in the scheme of things. He wouldn't likely be playing much this year at least. And uh, I think that the main reason he was brought in was because Ladislav Smead is out for the remainder of the year. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I, I, I think he's definitely been brought in because of that and because the Flames need some bodies on defense. Um, I mean, you know, 
Murray's been around the NHL for a while. He knows what it takes to play at the NHL level. And I guess I'm just kind of looking at him going, is this really a better choice than, say, Corey Potter or Tyler Watherspoon? Um, but, you know, if they do want to sign him down the stretch for just the re- the end of the year, I guess I'd be okay with that. Um, gives us some options. But I wouldn't sign him into next year until, you know, you bring him to training camp and make him audition again because we don't know what the blue line is going to look like next year. Definitely. And it, I would only have him on a PTO tryout for next year, not signing him for the full season. And I think the big Let him question... earn the spot. Yeah, no, exactly. Earn the spot. And I, I don't think he has right now earned, you know, a two-year deal this year or next year. I'd say, okay, you came in. We know what you've got now. Come back in... August and September for the, you know, the workouts, the tryouts, and let's see if you can earn it again next year. My, my other worry with Douglas Murray right now is he's only played eight games all year and they were over in the Dell league in Germany. And so I wonder about his compete level. I can't see going from the Dell league directly in the NHL after only playing eight games. Maybe if you're playing the entire season, but I think, I think that we'd probably find that he's going to be out of shape compared to a lot of our guys. Probably, and that's why they're having him working out in practice to see if he's got enough there to uh, be a legitimate player for us this year. Yeah, he wouldn't be my first choice to sign. Um, I mean, if they do sign him this year for the rest of the year, I can't see it being for any more than league minimum. Can you? Oh, no. It it would just be an insurance fill-in guy, not anything more than that. And I, I think the reason why they're looking at him over, say, a guy like Tyler Watherspoon is just because Watherspoon's needed in Adirondack as they're right in the middle of a playoff race of their own. Currently, they're residing in ninth, so... Yeah. Yeah, and, and if I if I understand the rule correctly, he can stay on a part-time tryout agreement for as long as he and the Flames agree to that, right? It's not like it's only limited to a week or anything? Yeah, I think so. I think it, as long as it, both sides are happy with that, if he wants to actually play in a game, he would need a contract for that. But if he's okay just practicing and getting his legs back under him, he's more than willing to do that, then he can stay here all year if that's what they want. Yeah, it's a mutually beneficial situation, then fine. If the Flames decide that they don't want him there anymore, then they can just say go home. Okay. Well, for in that case, you know, I don't see any reason to get rid of him off a of PTO. I mean, it's going to be cheap, and why not have an extra NHL, you know, player on your roster? But, yeah, I, I don't think I would probably sign him unless we lose another defenseman. Doesn't hurt having an insurance policy. Never does. Well, we're talking about the playoffs a little bit here, and the Flames race to the playoffs, and... Uh, we've been talking about that all year, and I don't know about you, Matt, but I think more this past week, seeing the Flames move up the uh, the standings within our division, I'm starting to really feel like maybe this team's got what it takes. Knock on wood, but you know, I start to feel like you know maybe this team can actually make it. Well, the fact that they're only two points up on ninth, which is LA currently, I'm not all that comfortable Uh, we'll have to wait until this upcoming homestand is finished because of the fact they play so many poorer teams and see how it goes from there but it, it as we're getting closer to the actual end of the season it's getting a little bit more of a realistic thing yeah, at the very beginning it was, wow, they're playing well. Wouldn't it be nice if? And, you know, now I'm already starting to see and uh, hear from, you know, bars on 17th Avenue preparing for the playoffs and that sort of thing. And I don't want anyone to be premature, but, yeah, it's, it looks more now like, you know, we may be in the postseason dance if everything keeps going right. Yeah, and, like, you look at the Winnipeg Jets and they're the de facto 8th, ninth team, and 
they're without Dustin Bufflin until the end of the month, and Tyler Myers was hurt briefly. Who knows? But the Flames, that's the team they have to beat, and we'll see. The next couple of games will help to set the tone, at least. And at least we're on the upside of that. We're not in ninth currently and trying to get in. Yeah, no, you're right, and and that's the thing is it's and this is I guess the part I'm the most happy about is that the Flames get to chart their own course this year. They're in the power position. They get to decide what's going to happen based on their play. It's not like we're waiting for other teams to lose and all these weird things going on. It's it's the Flames' destiny to chart their own course. Yeah, like we're not like where San Jose is, where they need teams like us to lose a couple of games and them to hopefully win a couple of games to get in or anything like that. Well, you know, one of the things that people always say is important in the playoffs is um, playoff history and guys who have playoff experience. And I was curious, so I did a little bit of research um, after reading some, some people asking online about how much playoff experience the Flames have. And if my numbers are correct here, it looks like the the current Flames active roster, not including Giordano, who's injured, has 374 total playoff games under their belt. Um, Yari Hoodler, no surprise, has the most with 66. And he's probably, though I didn't track it, also gone the furthest because he was with Detroit for so many years. Corey Potter has the least of the guys that have actually appeared in the playoffs with one game. And nine players on the team have zero games of playoff experience. So, you know, we do need those veterans going into the playoffs, the guys that have been there before. But, I don't know, to me, the fact that nine guys don't have playoff experience is not surprising, but a little bit unsettling. Well, if the Flames do make the playoffs, I wouldn't really anticipate them going on a an extended playoff run to, like, the conference finals or the Stanley Cup. So, like, even if they only play six or seven games and lose in the first round, at least they're getting their toes wet for next year and beyond. That's true. Um, A guy on that list that surprised me was Mason Raymond has, like, 50-some playoff wins. Or not wins, but 50-some playoff appearances. And I guess I, I had to look back at who he'd played for in the past, but... Of guys in this team, he wasn't one of the guys I was expecting to be one of the top playoff uh, experienced players. Well, Vancouver did make that run to the finals that well, that's one it. year. Yeah, and and so. that's where a lot of those games came because they played a lot of games in some of those rounds. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I always think of I never think of Raymond as a as a, uh, a Canuck. Every time I think of him, I think of him wearing a Leafs jersey. Well, that's kind of strange, considering he played most of his career with Vancouver. I know. Just the one year with Toronto. I know. It's weird. Every time I think of him, I'm like, how did he make the playoffs there? So, yeah, it is kind of weird. But I, it's probably because I'm trying to block out most of the guys who wear, Toronto, wear uh, Vancouver jerseys. True. So, yeah, that's kind of an interesting stat that I haven't checked other teams for comparisons or anything. But, you know, a, a fairly... Um, uh, a fairly inexperienced playoff team, as we saw in 04. Not saying that we're going to duplicate what happened in 04, but a fairly inexperienced playoff team, and that might come back to bite them when they get to the postseason. Well, the games, you know, it's all speculation until the games are actually played. So, who knows? Like, if the Flames end up going up against a team like Anaheim, who has tons of playoff experience, who knows? Maybe they can beat them. It we won't know until we get there. That's true. There's been a lot of surprises so far. There's no reason to think there won't be more surprises. Exactly. And plus with Calgary's ability to come back, who knows? Even if a team might think that they got them on the ropes, the Flames can come right back. Who knows? Yeah, no, for sure. We'll we'll definitely see what happens. It's been it's been such an interesting season so far that um you know, I have no doubt that if we do make the postseason, it's going to be an interesting postseason, too. I, d- I don't think it'll go probably the way a lot of people expect it to go. No. Like, I'm not expecting the Flames to be a four-and-out type thing. Well, 
I, it depends who we play. If we're against the Ducks and the first two games are in Anaheim, we we might be better to just stay home and rest. <laughs> there, Probably. I believe there is a forfeit rule in the NHL rule book. Oh, well, who knows? Like anything, things weird things can happen. The last time we faced the Ducks, we actually did win a game in Anaheim during that playoff series in 05-06. I think that was the last time we won in Anaheim. Yeah, it was. In the regular season, it was 03-04, when Kipper and Aginla weren't in the lineup. So Wow. And Travis and Iggy... Green scored one of the goals. <laughs> Holy cow. Well, Iggy and Kipper are in the lineup again, so we might have some postseason success there. Yeah. Well, Matt, an interesting article uh, I found this week from the guys over Flames Nation. Um, just looking at it quickly here, it's the Flames breakdown of how they've done against divisions this year. And I thought it was kind of interesting to note that um, with three games against division rivals to go, the Flames so far have accumulated 19 wins over their division opponents. That's exactly one half of their 38 wins to date coming against teams they spend roughly 35% of their, te- of their season playing. So we've we've been very good in our own division uh, this year, which is excellent to see because for years the Pacific Division was seen as one of the toughest divisions in the league. And so I think you could debate that maybe that's not the case anymore, but to be able to conquer your own division like that is pretty impressive. Well, it's actually extra beneficial because of the fact that uh, for the first two rounds of the playoffs, that's who you'll be facing as your division opponents. It's a good point. So... Uh, if the Flames do make the playoffs and are in one of the top three seeds, it's very likely that we'll end up facing one of those teams in the first round, unless we're one of the wild card teams or we somehow manage to pass Anaheim, which I don't even think's a realistic possibility. No, so, I, I think that we have a lot of other things to worry about than passing Anaheim at this point. Yeah, we're 14 points behind with 13 games to go. I don't really see that happening. (laughs) So interesting breakdown here in this Flames Nation article. Um, Our record against the Pacific Division is 19-6-1, which gives us a 75% win percentage against them. Central Division, which I think a lot of people are saying the Central Division is the hardest division this year. We're 6-6-1 for 50% win percentage. The Atlantic Division, we haven't done so hot against. We were 8-5-3. For 59%. And the division that... Really the only division we've actually lost to in aggregate this year is the Metropolitan Division. And we're 5-9-0 and for a 36% win chance. Which that's actually kind of surprising because we're not usually good against the teams that are in the Atlantic Division. Like, in my memory, like teams like Pittsburgh and all that usually mop the floor with Calgary. So the fact that we're actually worse against the metro division is surprising yeah the metropolitan division is the rangers the islanders the penguins the capitals and the flyers and we haven't seen those teams a lot this year but yeah it seems like they've five nine and oh we've only won five against them so yeah they've still got our numbers oh. for the most part oh my mistake i was flipping the atlantic and the metro yeah my mistake yeah, no, so yeah, yeah it, yeah, Metropolitan is the is kind of the New York uh, Tri Cities division, and they're yeah they're the, that makes they're sense, the division we've had the most trouble with, and that makes sense because I think we saw them on our big road trip, and you know seeing them all back to back probably wasn't great for that stat either. No, and we usually don't fare too well against those teams historically, even so, it's not surprising that they ran into troubles against them. Yeah. And the Flames have three games left against their division. One against the Coyotes, one against the Oilers, and one against the Kings. And I think if you look at where those teams are uh, right now, you'll see that probably the Flames, if everything goes the way it should, would beat the Coyotes, beat the Oilers, and only the Kings might give us a bit of a problem. And even if we only get four of the six points, that's really good for what we need right now. Oh, for sure. For sure. So yeah, interesting article. Just thought I'd touch on that a bit. We will uh, we'll tweet this article from uh, Ari over at Flames Nation, so everyone can read it. Uh, we'll tweet it and we'll put it on our Facebook page in case you want to read it. But really interesting 
article, they break down exactly how we've done against every team in our division, uh, how that team has done against other teams. So it's quite interesting to read. We won't get into all of it, but we'll let people explore that on their own if they want to. Matt, we uh, we were talking before the show today, and we said there's been a while since we've talked about uh, the farm prospects. It's been a while since we've looked deep into the Flames system, really, besides talking about how the team has done overall in Adirondack. And we thought maybe it's time to take another look through the Flames system and see how the team is doing. Sounds like you a good idea. You haven't watched many of the games recently, and neither have I. We've just been so busy that we haven't... We've, we've both seen clips, but we haven't watched a game, admittedly, since about the middle of last month, right? Yeah. Life gets in the way sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So, brief rundown here um, that we'll start with is how some of the guys are doing in Adirondack um, in the last little bit. Believe it or not, Devin Setaguchi is finally back. That's not something I thought I'd be saying. Uh, he's picked up his game since he returned from injury after the trade deadline, and he has two goals and three assists in the last three games. So there, there's a guy who's looking for, um, I guess, probably an NHL job next year. Five points in three games for Adirondack. I didn't think he'd be performing when he came back. Yeah, I'm actually somewhat surprised that he even returned to the club in Adirondack. Yeah, I mean, me too. I kind of expected that they'd probably just let him, you know, walk and suspend him or whatever they do. But I also have a feeling they may have brought him back because they needed a body. True. Like and they are lost currently. A lot of players. Yeah, they're currently playing uh, Patrick Sealoff as a right winger right at the moment. And he's usually a defenseman. Exactly. And according to uh, some of what I've seen online. Um, I've also been, been reading for people and talking to people who have gone to the games who've said that in Ordeo's absence, Brad Thyssen and Doug Carr, who was called up as the backup, uh, have been playing well. Carr's been surprising at times with how well he's played, and Thyssen has looked uh, solid when he's been playing, but that they can definitely tell that um, they're missing Ordeo. Neither of these guys are, are going to steal games down the stretch, but they've been able to hold down the fort, and... Looking at the stats and where the Adirondack Flames are right now, that might be the thing that cost them a playoff spot. Oh, definitely. When you go from having a goalie that's a NHL caliber guy like Ordeo and go to an AHL quality goaltender, it it's a noticeable drop off. Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. And it's you know, it's good that those two goalies are doing what they can to hold down the fort. But, yeah, I mean, it's like, a, you know, we're fortunate here this year because we have two great goalies in Calgary. But any other year, it'd be like if Kipper got hurt and McElhaney went to play. You know, there'd definitely be a big drop there. So I sympathize with the Adirondack fans because they've lost their, their good goaltender. But glad to see that somebody's stepping in there at least to hold down the fort. And, They've let in a lot of goals lately, the Adirondack team. I think they had two games where they let in eight goals in a week in each game. So, yeah, it's probably showing that those guys aren't the goalies that are going to take you very far. No, and it's unfortunate, but the way things are trending, Adirondack is looking like they'll be sliding out of a playoff spot and miss the playoffs entirely. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, it, it it's one of those things that them losing Shore, Poirier, Granlund, uh, Furland, those things do take a toll, and they don't really have a lot of depth to replace those guys. Uh, the only guy that's been performing at the top of the game of late has been David Wolf, and. Bill Arnold, since his return, he's played well. But beyond that, like everybody else is kind of waffling in the middle. Well, let's chat about Bill Arnold for a minute because he was a guy that, if you remember at the beginning of the year, I wasn't sure how he was going to do in Adirondack without Johnny. And, you know, he's been Johnny Hockey's sidekick for years. That's, you know, his M.O., I guess, was almost being that sidekick. And I was really curious to see how we do this year. I honestly thought he was going to flounder. I thought we'd have a bad year from Arnold. And really, it would take him a couple of years to figure out who he was without having Johnny by his side. But 
He's done pretty well this year. In 45 games played, he has 11 goals and 15 assists for 26 points. Um, so, to me, that's quite a surprise. I'm pleasantly surprised by how well he's done establishing a new identity without Johnny Hockey playing with him. Yeah, in the 2013 development camp, he looked like a a solidly above average skater and nothing to write home about. But coming into this past development camp back in July, his speed and fitness level really improved. And that, I think, is the main reason why he has had such a good season is that he has taken his fitness level and speed up a, to a higher level and it's allowing him to adapt more to the AHL game and with him having 26 points in 45 games if you extrapolate that that's almost a 50 point season in the yeah, AHL so you know that's pretty good it, it, you would expect those type of numbers from an AHL veteran player not a rookie yeah. So that that's showing that in next year and beyond, there's uh, some NHL potential there, even if it's not a high-level NHL spot. Yeah, Arnold was out for a while. He had a shoulder injury, and since he's been back, he has two goals and three assists in last week and a half. So good to see that he's coming back and he's stepping in right away. As we know, sometimes these guys take a while, too get their groove back, but that's really good to see. It shows his fitness level. And another player who's having, who is having a great month so far, a guy that I wouldn't expect to be is Kenny Agostino. Uh, he's one of the scoring leaders on the team. He has two goals and six assists in the last six game. And apparently is, I'm just looking at the stats here, getting a lot more ice time recently. So Agostino is one of those guys that I've never really been sure how he's going to pan out. You want him to pan out well, or at least I do because of how we acquired him. He came as part of the flurry deal, but good to see that maybe Aginla. he's... Oh, sorry, the Aginla deal, my bad. Yeah, uh, came as the Jerome Aginla, part of that package. And so it's good to see that he's, you know, on the upward trajectory, hopefully. Yeah, well, the, the thing uh, with having so many quality players in the organization is that removing their top line allows guys like Augustino, Hanowski, and others to step up their ice time and their roles and try to take spots. And Augustino has elevated his game. He's now producing at a half point per game in the AHL this season, which is all right for a first-year pro. He'll have to make strides next year to better that, but he's progressing. And with guys like Hanowski and Augustino, they're not the best players, but if as long as they're showing forward progress, that's all you can ask. And you just have to wait and see on these guys. Like it's not a linear process and some guys will step up and take NHL jobs like Juris. Others might regress. You just don't know until you get there. And that's where we start to see some of the surprises. Like you said, the Juris. And I think one of the guys that might be that surprise at the AHL level this year, at least for me is Garnet Hathaway. Um, we saw him a little bit at the, at the development camp, to me, he didn't look very spectacular at all. Um, I expect him to spend most of the year actually in the ECHL and probably be a call-up, but he's actually doing really well right now. In 59 games, he has 15 goals and 13 assists for 28 points on the year. So, you know, and, uh, maybe he is the Josh Juris of our AHL team this year. That surprise guy who's really developed well. Yeah, I... I thought he would played well enough where he should have gotten an NHL contract, even though like he'd be playing in the AHL instead of just an AHL contract. And I'm somewhat surprised that he hasn't been signed thus far this season because of the level of his play. Yeah, see, I, I didn't see him maybe as, as um, favorably as you did. I thought that with a lot of the guys in the ice... He was keeping up, but there were some rough spots to his game that I thought, looking at the Flames' depth chart, he just he wasn't going to make much of himself this year. I thought they were going to have a much deeper team than they did. 
And, you know, again, maybe he's one of these guys that sees the opportunity of a lot of the upper echelon of the HL team being recalled for most of the season. Yeah. Well, uh, opportunity is one thing and seizing it is another. And Hathaway and a guy like Turner Elson have both seized their opportunities and become leaders down on the Adirondack team. Whether that translates next year and beyond into becoming NHL players is yet to be seen, but they're doing all the things that are necessary to get the opportunity for next year and then beyond. Yeah, and you know, I think Hathaway might be in the interesting position of now raising eyebrows of other GMs and being in the position where if we don't sign him, somebody else will. Yeah, and that's why I wouldn't be opposed to the Flames even signing him today, even, and just having him under contract for next year. Say, okay, you had 28 points thus far, and beat that next year, and be one of the leaders on Stockton. He'll be one of the older guys there. He's 23 right now. Exactly, and it's not like the Flames won't have a need for a player like Hathaway, who's a decent two-way physical forward, even if he's only just the AHL depth guy for next year. As we're seeing now, injuries and recalls happen, and you need quality guys to step up. Even if he's only an AHL player for his career, you still need guys like that. Would he have to qualify for an entry-level deal? Would we have to offer him three years? Or because of his age, could we offer him just a one-year deal? Well, I think because of the fact he came out of the NCAA and his age, I think you can just sign him to a two-year deal. So if they signed him today, I think they would only have to pay him out for the remainder of this year and then next year. Hmm. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that because... The different leagues have, and the different ages have different rules for the term. I think it's two years, though. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I know that an entry-level deal is uh, three years. You can't do any more. You can't do any less. It's uh, three years on that deal. So, yeah, I didn't know. Because three years might be a, a long time to keep them around. But I could see doing this year and next year for sure. Yeah. And... It's one of those things. He's done enough where I think that he's deserved a shot again next year. And it's one of those things. He could just fall flat and not be worth it. And in which case, then you just don't re-sign him. Yeah, and, you know, in, in that case, too, he could always go play in the ECHL and, you know, try to pick up his game. Uh, to me, if Setaguchi can pick up his game, anyone can. Exactly. More competition is better. That's the way I look at it. And the last guy we'll we'll talk about on the AHL roster, unless someone else you want to highlight, is Max Reinhardt, a guy who I was saying on the show before the trade deadline, I didn't think would perhaps be in a Flames jersey after the deadline. Uh, he's having a good march. He has three goals and six assists in his last seven games. So, you know, good point production in there. And I think Reinhardt, from what I've seen of him this year, might be realizing that his game is really more of a playmaker. And, you know, f f the games I've seen him play, he looks like he's developing into a, into a good playmaker, and that could help him stick around for a little bit longer. Yeah, Reinhardt's had a really terrible year, and his shooting percentage is way, way, way down from last year. I, I don't know what exactly is wrong with him in terms of shooting the puck. Like, I know he had over 50 points last year, and he's only got 25 this year, and most of that's been recent production. I'm hoping that he can just have the one bad year and bounce back, but he's got a lot of work to do, and I don't know if he's going to be able to bounce back or not. We'll see, and... He, like a lot of players, like Kanowski and Augustino and that, they're kind of on the bubble of not really sure whether or not they should be back in a Flames jersey next year. 
Well, and Reinhardt, as we talked about before, and you know, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but um, Reinhardt was a guy that I think everyone looked at as one of the top prospects coming into this year, and I feel like he's fallen on the depth chart because a lot of other guys have pushed themselves higher than him. So I think he, of all of the prospects, has a lot of proving to do to show that he's still one of the one of the pinnacle prospects. Exactly, and that's why you need as many good players in your organization as possible, both in terms of drafted players and signed players, and have that competition because some guys will fall flat, and we didn't expect Sven Berchi to fall flat like he did, but he did, and you know, you got a guy like Josh Juris who came out of nowhere, and He's taken a spot in the NHL. So, if Reinhardt falters, maybe a guy like Bill Arnold takes his spot in the organization in terms of talent and positioning. Who knows? But it, it's just good to have the competition to allow the, the best players to rise to the top. And a final note at the, I guess, Flames AHL level. The Flames finally picked the name for their new AHL team next year. The team will be known as the Stockton Heat. And fortunately, they didn't do what I thought they were going to do and just use the old Adirondack or uh, Abbotsford Heat logo and put Stockton on it. But uh, the logo is on our Twitter and Facebook right now. If anyone wants to see it, it's also on the Flames website. I'm not a big fan of the new logo. No, it's one of the, in my opinion, one of the worst logos of any team that I've seen for an AHL club. It's not very well done, in my opinion. Actually, and... the Adirond or Abbotsford Heat logo, I actually preferred that one to Stockton's. That's how. Uh, yeah, wasn't I was a never a big fan big of that fan. one, but yeah, I, I prefer that one over what they've got now. Yeah. Just a missed opportunity. And they're, they're using the Flames' current jerseys as well, which is lazy. It, it is what it is. And, you know, who knows? I am i don't know. I try to not put too much stock in what the AHL team looks like because it seems for the Flames that it's not going to last very long. They keep moving their teams. That I'm really, I don't know, I've kind of given up on what they're doing down there and stopped caring about it. Yeah. I know. The logo looks a little too clipboardy. It almost, taste, but. yeah, to me, it almost looks like they're not planning to keep it for very long. Yeah. It looks like, let's just throw this together because we need something for next year. It almost looks like some of our rejected logos for our site. <laughs> you know, it, the logo though looks, yeah, you're right. It does. Some Nobody ever saw that, but some of the logos that we had for Fireside Chat made up, um, it does remind me of something that might look good on the Flames' third jersey template, though. Yeah. Just looking at the current third jersey template where there's a little bit more black than what we have right now. It might look good on that. Yeah. Like, if they had went with the the third jersey as the main template and, like, made a white version of that, then that logo would have made a lot more sense. But yeah, who knows? Yeah, so if anyone's interested, you can go to our, our Facebook or Twitter to see that, or you can go to the Flames site. And Matt, before we uh, before we finish tonight, we might as well take a quick look at some of the other Flames prospects who aren't playing at the pro level and how they're doing this year. Um, I won't go through all of them, but let's look at some of the big names, and I think probably the one most people are going to be wondering about is how Sam Bennett is doing after he recovered from his injury and got sent back to the Kingston front next of the OHL. Uh, Bennett has played nine games. He has 11 goals and 10 assists in those nine games for 21 points. That's fantastic. Eh, it's okay. You know, it's marginal. <laughs> Averaging 2.3 points a game for a guy that hasn't, you know, played most of the season. That's really exciting for us Flame fans to, to get the chance to see that guy next year. Yeah, I can see why uh, Doug Gilmore was jumping up and down when the Flames said that they were sending him back there. Yeah, me too. I mean, that kind of production alone could change a team's fate. 
Well, since uh, he's been down in Kingston, the Frontenacs have seen their goals per game boost by 1.7. That's a so, lot. So, yeah. So, I'm sure that the team that they'll be facing in the first round of the playoffs isn't exactly pleased with that. I think they'll be playing Niagara, but, yeah, that's not nice <laughs> for them. No, Having such a successful season and then, oh, great, one of the top players in the OHL came back. Yay! Now we get to deal with a team that should have been first or second in the OHL as the sixth or seventh place team. Great. Yeah, but, you know, good for Bennett to be able to jump back in and produce so well after being out for most of a season. Oh, yeah. And, says a and lot I'm about looking... his determination and his drive. Yeah, I'm looking forward to an extended run by the Frontenacs, and I actually wouldn't be surprised if they end up surprising and winning the OHL. You think so? Well, they have Lawson Kroos, who's one of the top prospects in the draft this year on their team opposite uh, Bennett. So having a good one-two punch and one of the top goalies in the OHL, I don't see why they couldn't win it. That's true. Uh, looking at some of these other players that have been impressive this year, Morgan Klimchuk, another player that we've all um, you know been eager to see how he's doing, plays with the Brandon Wheat Kings. And in 57 games, he has 32 points and 41 assists for a total of or sorry, 32 goals, 41 assists for a total of 73 points on the year. So again, a guy who's having a fantastic season. And to yeah. me, that's not surprising. We knew Klimchuk was going to have a good season. We know he's a good player. Yeah, he, his point production is about where you would expect him to be. Not Nothing exceptional for his season. Nothing alarming like if he only had like 50 points then you'd be going what's wrong with Klimchuk but you know a solid production solid progress and next year he'll be in at or Stockton so we'll begin to see how he transitions into a pro there's nothing that's showing any warning signs so that's all good and an, a player that I'm quite surprised we're seeing this kind of production from him this year is Austin Carroll. He was the seventh round pick in the 2014 draft. He plays for the Victoria Royals. And in 67 games, he has 37 goals, 39 assists for 76 points. So, I mean, if you compare, you know, Klimchuk, who is a first round pick at 73 points, and Carroll, who is a seventh round pick, Carroll actually ha has more points this year. And to me, that's surprising because I didn't expect much from Austin Carroll when he drafted him. No, but uh, he is an overage player, and it's one of those things that it, it would actually, it, much in the same way that Klimchuk, it, like if he had 50 points, if Carroll wasn't putting up the numbers that he was, it would be somewhat surprising as well. Usually the overage players tend to be the leading scorers on teams in the Canadian Hockey League, so... Yeah, it's and, good. and I expect him to be among the leading scorers. I just wasn't expecting him to have that kind of production. No, and it like Klemchuk, we'll see him in Stockton next year, and at least he's producing well. Like, there's nothing... It's not like he's Carroll only had, like, 25 or 30 points, and you're going, oh, well, that guy's not going to do much. If he can continue his progress, maybe he makes the NHL someday... I wouldn't expect him to be a top six forward, but he, you know, if he becomes a solid third, fourth line guy like a Lance Boma, that's awesome. Even if he can take the kind of role that Josh Juris has held down this year. Exactly. When you're drafting in the seventh round, if you get an NHL player out of that, that's awesome. It doesn't matter what role they're doing. Very true. And the last player I'll highlight here uh, who's playing in the in the Canadian Hockey League, unless you want to chat about anyone else, but a um, guy that I've seen more of since he got traded to Calgary, and that's Keegan Kanzig, um, now playing for the Hitmen. In 67 games this year, he has three goals and nine assists for 22 total points and 164 penalty minutes. 
This is a guy that when I watch the Hitmen play, I mean, he's mean, he's nasty, he seems like the kind of defenseman that the Flames want. Yeah, and his offense isn't exactly great with only 22 points in his overage year, but realistically, if and when he makes the NHL, you're not exactly expecting him to be Chris Russell out there. You're, no, you're not. wanting him to beat the living crap out of somebody. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, I'm looking at him playing in the dub, and I'm seeing his game improving since he got to Calgary. Um, not that I've you know watch a ton of Hitmen games, but I'll watch them when they're on uh, when they're on, or I can find them online. And and he's he's looking better. Um, I think that he's on a stronger defensive core this year, which maybe is why he's not getting as many points. There's a lot of other guys doing that, but yeah, he seems like the kind of guy who would fit in well here. He's got the sandpaper. He seems almost like the kind of defenseman that would fit in well on a Daryl Sutter team, especially. But we're seeing the Flames going back to that gritty style, and so I think he'll he'll work well here. Yeah, it, if he can work on his skating, which that was his issue after he was drafted, and can be quick enough where he's not going to be slow at the NHL level, then he probably will become an NHL defenseman just because of that. And yeah, I think his, his career is probably as a six seven guy. Yeah, and if he can just be that raw, physical, mean sixth defenseman, sort of what Derek England is, but you know, a six foot seven version, then that would be excellent. And you need players like that, especially with a guy like Gaudreau. You know, you don't want to have to face off against a six foot seven guy that is angry. <laughs> When we talked about this in the preseason, I think that uh, Kanzig will perhaps get more chances than the guy who wasn't his size will because everyone likes to have those big, hulking defensemen. Yeah, definitely. And having a guy like that that has no problem throwing the gloves down to mix it up, that also helps. And just a final note on the prospects, uh, unless there's anyone else you want to talk about. uh, 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 There is. Oh. Uh, there is, uh, I want to highlight Mason McDonald, uh, who was drafted in the second round last year. Uh, he has a 3.06 goals against average and a 906 save percentage for Charlottetown, which doesn't sound very good, but he's one of the top goalies in the QMJHL. Uh, he routinely, his team doesn't have a good defense score, so he's routinely facing like 40, 50 shots a game, and he's the reason why they're as good this year. So he's doing a very good job, and I'm looking forward to his progression next year, and hopefully he can push for a starting job down the line. Yeah, you really have to kind of, if you watch him, take into account everything that's going on. I was able to watch one of their games online this year, Uh, Charlotte's games and like you said the defense is not good there so he gets shelled with a lot of shots and if you can appreciate that fact and watch his goaltending outside of that he does look like a good future goaltender for sure but it would be nice to see him have a stronger defense in front of him well I think you'll have to wait until he's in Stockton or wherever the Flames farm team is when (laughs) he's in the AHL and just move on from there. It, you know, it, it, it's good that he's getting as many shots against him now because it does help the more shots you face to improve your game. For sure. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how he progresses. Um, you know I wasn't a fan of his coming out of the prospect camp. I thought that he wasn't showing as well as I thought he would. But, yeah, we'll, we'll see how he turns out and see how he looks, you know, coming into the next prospect camp. Exactly. Lots to look forward to in July. And the last note here on prospects then is that uh, Providence of the NCAA has been eliminated from the playoffs, and that means that uh, Gillies, Jankowski, and Gilmore are all done for the season unless uh, Providence goes to the Frozen Four. So guys that we might see potentially get an AHL tryout or an NHL tryout. Do you think there's any possibility those guys jump to the NHL? I think they'll probably all end up at the A if they get a tryout. Uh, well, the 
the weird thing with how the Frozen Four setup is is that it depends on who actually wins the playoffs will okay. determine whether a team like Providence gets an invite. Because so Providence, wait? yeah, uh, huh. if because uh, uh, Providence was the second rated team from their conference, so it depends on who wins, but. We might not see them get signed right away. It, if they do, though, I would expect Gillies would definitely be manning the nets in a, Adirondack for the balance yeah. of the season. Uh, Jankowski, he, he might want to go back for another year. He might want to... I would expect if Gilmore and uh, Jankowski are signed, they'll likely get a game or two, sort of like Van Brabant last year. Yeah, I can see Flames Brass being eager to see what they've got with Jankowski, too. Yeah, it, I wouldn't expect them to play a lot, but, uh, you know, a game or two, just to, like a thank you for signing on the dotted line kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think that'll also depend on how Calgary's doing down the stretch, too. I don't think they'll put them in there if we're fighting for a playoff berth. No. In that case, well, you'd send them right down to Adirondack and let them play the remainder there. Well, that wraps up our prospect preview tonight. Hopefully everyone, uh, you know, enjoyed catching up with some of those prospects. And, uh, as we've said all season, the flames have a bright future. I guess you could say the, you know, the prospects are burning bright. And so some guys to watch there, definitely some good talent coming up. Oh yeah. And with the flames having as many draft picks in the first three rounds this year, we'll be getting another whole batch of top end guys. So we'll have even more good players to preview in July at the development camp. More names to remember. Yep. So Matt, why don't we keep uh, that? Got to keep that pipeline filled. That's right. That's that's what we we have to make sure that we're doing in a rebuild is we have to keep new players coming in and evaluate the players we have and really figure out if they want to come back or not. And I think there's definitely players that won't be returning and players that definitely will be. So it, it'll be good, guys, you know, like and we'll talk more about this in in, you know, the off season, but guys like Kandari probably won't be coming back. So it's good that we'll have guys to replace them. Exactly. Why don't we look ahead to the next week um, and what we have on tap? Um, we tabulated the results from last week, and Matt, believe it or not, you finally won another week. Um, last week, the Flames, the Flames had six total points. You guessed four. I thought we'd end up with five points, and we ended up with four. So it's now four-two in favor of me this season. Um, and this week coming up, we have the Blues on Tuesday. We have the. Um, Flyers coming in on Thursday, and that's for Retro Night. That's when the Flames will be wearing their retro jerseys again. And Hiller has a new mask. They've been promoting it all over the Flames website. Saturday's a matinee game against the Columbus Blue Jackets. And Monday night we have the uh, Colorado Avalanche. All of those are home games, so we have a four-game homestand there. How do you think we're going to do? I'm going to go with six points. So you think they're going to get six of the eight? Yeah, I think they'll beat the Blues, the Flyers, and the Avalanche. Okay, so the only game you don't think they're going to win against is the Blue Jackets. Yeah, they don't do good in afternoon games, so I'll That's give true. them the loss there. I, I'm i going to be a little bit more pessimistic, I guess. I think we're going to do four points. I think that we're going to struggle against the Blues and the Blue Jackets. I think we'll do well against the Flyers, and I think we can beat uh, the Avalanche. So I'm going to go with uh, two of the four. All right. So we will check back next week and see how we did, but it's going to be nice to have the Flames at home for uh, five games. Yeah, and at least they're facing four weaker opponents, so hopefully they can start to cement themselves firmly in a playoff spot and not have to hope for other teams to lose to me right anyway. now that's that's all i can ask for is for the flames to keep themselves in a position where they can control their own destiny even if they're not in the playoffs i'd rather they're not in on their own accord than not being in because some other team didn't win some pivotal game somewhere exactly 
All right, Matt. So, well, uh, uh, enjoy your homestand. As always, go Flames, go, and thank you for listening. Enjoy the homestand, and we'll talk to you next week. Take care, everybody. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.